We'll go to the next, um, next story for today. Inside Climate News, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for national reporting, doesn't even have an office. It's a lean operation. Today, they have a staff of seven, but in the beginning, there were just two. Theirs is a David and Goliath story. Three reporters working for a five-year-old nonprofit with then just four people took on the powerful oil industry and told the world about the biggest oil spill they had never heard of. In the fall of 2011, as the national debate on the Keystone XL pipeline was ramping up, Lisa, Elizabeth, and their colleague, David Hasemir, began reporting on pipeline safety. What would happen, they wanted to know, if oil pipelines ruptured and spilled crude into the rivers and the aquifers, the primary sources of water for drinking and irrigation. For the next 15 months, they traveled around the country to find answers to that question. Their reporting took them to towns along the Kalamazoo River in southwestern Michigan. In July 2010, a pipeline owned by the Canadian company Enbridge Inc. was ruptured, dumping over a million gallons of crude oil into the river. The story had been largely ignored by the media. When Inside Climate News dug into it, they found many reasons why you and I should be worried about pipeline safety. One, the Enbridge pipeline had an extensive and documented history of corrosion problems, yet regulators didn't press them to make repairs. Two, Enbridge wasn't even required by law to tell first responders what the pipeline was carrying when it ruptured. Three, what the pipeline was carrying was diluted bitumen, or dilbit, the dirtiest, stickiest oil on the market. Bitumen is as thick as peanut butter, so it doesn't flow like most crude oil. It also has to be thinned with large amounts of chemicals, including the carcinogenic benzene. The team's findings go beyond the Michigan spill. Their reporting revealed, one, the technology used on most of the nation's oil pipelines cannot detect spills, and two, more effective technology is available, but federal regulators don't require pipeline operators to use it. Not for the planned Keystone pipeline or for thousands of miles of other new and repurposed pipelines that are being planned. Since 2010, over a million gallons of diluted bitumen has been recovered from the site of the spill in Michigan. Enbridge has spent close to $800 million for the cleanup. It's the most expensive oil pipeline spill in U.S. history. And we wouldn't have known much about it were it not for inside climate news. Elizabeth, this is a classic, you know, waiting to be told story. In the beginning, you weren't even looking at the Michigan Dilbit disaster. You were doing research on the Keystone Pipeline. Can you tell us how it was you ended up reporting largely on Michigan? Well, yes, I can. Um, excuse me. Uh, I had been hired in 2010, I was told to cover the elections, the federal elections from an energy and environment standpoint. So I parachuted into places, ended up in Nebraska because I thought the Keystone would be an issue. It turns out the people were very interested in the issue. The politicians were sort of giving it the classic Heisman and not interested in it. So we were, as I delved into this, we started to write more and more about Keystone. Lisa came on board, she started to investigate, and we thought, some, we need to tell a tale, but we were not in Michigan in 2010 when this spill happened. So the first we, an editor, we had some conference calls about, should we go look at this? So I did some research, went out to Kalamazoo, and I didn't get there until the fall of 2011. And I had done enough legwork so I was able to see there's a story here. There are, there are health issues. There is, there's the whole angle of this diluted bitumen. It's, there are multiple angles. But once I found John LaForge, who is the lead in the story, whose trail we follow throughout the whole thing, I thought, we have a story. I mean, this guy. Honestly, I talked to him more than my spouse, I think, for <laughs> seven or eight months. So we, it just had all the elements, plus the cleanup was still going on. Okay, I, I think we have to introduce John LaForge to, I don't think everyone here read the story, right? I mean, own up everybody, how many? So 
Tell us why John LaForge and why was that the key to your story? Well, he was a man who I, I called him from my, I, we live in, I live in Washington, D.C. Remember, we live all in different places and are working out of our home. We're not, you know, in one newsroom. So every time we want to communicate, we're texting, emailing, calling, whatever. So I had found John LaForge and the first time I called him, he he said, well, he said, I'd, I'd like you to come out. I'd be interested in talking to you. And you have to hold the phone out here because this guy has this large voice. And he, uh, he's a resident. He's of a resident Kalamazoo. of, right, he lives in Marshall, yeah. Michigan, which was ground zero for that spill. He had this peanut butter like black goo wafting through his property. He had to be evacuated from his home. His whole family had to move to a hotel. He has never moved back to his home. He, he built, he did get a settlement from Enbridge, he built a new home. So he became my story. And when I met him, it was even better. I mean, I thought, this guy is out of central casting. I mean, he's what reporters <laughs> look for. So when I got out there and had, con he guided me around. And you know, that's the magic of reporting. You have to do the legwork, but you have to be open-minded enough to listen so that you don't get tunnel vision and think, this is my story and I'm going to tell it this way. So every time he mentioned somebody, I was going, I, I would, you know, one thing led to another. It was this thing where you get one source because I was putting together a narrative, but I was there when the narrative was halfway through. So I had to go back and try to put the reader in the place, what happened to John LaForge the day that that pipe started spewing oil into that wetland where his and his house was right near the creek and it just coated his entire yard. So strong character, riveting story, that's one thing that makes this series really great, but the other part of it is the science part. Lisa, you have a science degree from MIT, so how did you begin even looking at the scientific li literature? How did you even figure out what you were looking for? Um, well, I I tried at first. Uh, I guess I got pulled into this story about halfway through. Um, Susan, our editor, said, Lisa, you should help with the science. And I thought, OK, I'll just look up something on Google Scholar. But it didn't exist. Um, there, wasn't, there were no peer-reviewed journal articles about how Dilbit behaves when it spills into water. So then my plan B was to call up experts in Canada they were university researchers or industry scientists who work with Dilbit, and none of them would return my phone calls. So that didn't work either. So I ended up going through as many public documents as I could find. Uh, there were a couple of reports from the EPA, and there were some petroleum engineering textbooks someone found for me, and just really taking any tiny bit of information I could find on the chemistry of Dilbit. And then I would put together these notes and give them to oil spill experts in the U.S. And these were people who had never worked with Dilbit, but they had worked on the BP oil spill or, you know, they had worked in other, they had worked with NOAA and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and they knew enough chemistry that I would give them little bits and pieces and they could put together the story for me. Um, so they were able to tell me that, yes, you know, given the little bit of information you've given me, this is how the oil would react. This is, it makes sense that you know, after a few days, most of the light chemicals would evaporate, which is when the heavy oil sinks, and that's why you have a problem. So that's how I approach the science. Uh, and then the other thing that really helped was Inside Climate sent me to an IRE boot camp for journalists on Excel on Access. And having that skill set was, was really helpful. We were able to fact check and pull out interesting tidbits from the air monitoring that EPA had done um, after the spill, because they were trying to figure out how much benzene was in the air and was it safe for people to breathe. So that helped there. And also using one of the federal databases on pipeline safety, I, I was able to figure out for a follow-up story that most of, during most of the oil pipeline spills in the country, uh, the the software that they have for detecting spills is pretty much useless. So only 5% of those spills were detected by the company's technology. And that was, again, really helpful. The, the interesting finding in this series was that the federal regulators didn't even know what was going on at the time of the oil spill. Right. right? Uh, the way the, the regulations are set up, 
the regulators know if a pipeline contains crude oil or natural gas or you know, compressed CO2 or something like that. But they don't know what type of crude oil is in the pipeline. And the company didn't tell the EPA or anyone exactly what type of oil was in the line. And people found out because uh, I think it was a week after the spill, some scientist walked into the river and all this oil started bubbling up from the bottom of the river. And that's when they realized they had a problem. Um, and also, there were some local reporters at the time, it was the Mich Michigan Messenger. They uh, questioned the CEO of the company a lot and sort of got him to admit it was Dilbit. This, this is essentially a, a, a narrative of, a, of an oil spill. And there are so many moving parts to it. I mean, how did you put that chronology together? I mean, what, what were your main sources of information? For example, how did you find out regulators didn't know? How did you find out what the, what the company told the regulators at that point? Right. Well, we were, we were gathering from every... That's why we had to bring in Lisa, because it was just getting too huge. We had all this science, and when you're trying to advance a story, you can tell a great story, but we wanted to back it up with the science, even if it was just a parenthetical phrase or maybe a paragraph. So all of that research we were doing, and, and I think that we were sort of learning, what, like with the EPA, that the fact that they were talking to me, the, the federal government isn't exactly cooperative on many levels, you will find out, but I think they were hoping that we would get some answers that maybe they weren't getting. So they were sharing information, which, which was very helpful. So it was a matter of, I mean, I threw out a rough draft so that we could see all our holes, but we knew we needed to check and we had to do our due diligence. I mean, we had to be accurate. So this was going over and over and over things, calling you know people in Washington, checking with the people in Michigan. I mean, it is a constant back and forth. You're an online-only news organization with a small staff and a small budget, and you're taking on the oil industry. Um, that's, that's not easy, right? <laughs> no, that's why you use a tape recorder when you're in the room with Enbridge and there are four of them and one of you. But what, you, you yeah, but what you obstacles did you face? I mean, where, did you feel a lawsuit, for example? What, did you have enough resources to continue the reporting? Did you have enough editorial support? Yeah, I mean, w when we started this, I didn't know what it was going to turn into. I, I felt like I was building a geometric shape that maybe hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> and so, yes, the fear, I mean, fear drives you because you can't afford to make a mistake. So we, I mean, I would send paragraphs to Enbridge and say, this is what we're writing. Can you please, and I mean, they were so tired of me, but I, I, my, my phrase was, look, it, we have to be accurate. And, and this, is, this is my name. This is all I have as a journalist. We, we cannot afford to, to make a mistake. So you have to work with me. And we did that with everybody, going over and over. I mean, hundreds of phone calls and, re, and reviewing of databases. So it's, yeah, it is a little scary, especially when the day before you're going to publish, Enbridge says to you, you know, Elizabeth, that wasn't diluted bitumen that spilled. That was just heavy crude oil. And you knew that it was diluted bitumen because we had, but still, your heart's kind of popping out of your body at that point. So. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did, you get legal, was, did you get legal advice? Was your story reviewed by a lawyer? Were, were there any fears of the legal consequences if you went on through the story? Yeah, we did. We, we had an attorney going over everything because there, there were those fears that we were in over our heads or that we had said things. But we felt, I mean, we sat and read this thing to one another. I mean, you know, I'm in Washington, Lisa's in Boston, our editor is in California. We're reading and looking for holes and then having other people read it and looking for holes. I mean, we had as many people as possible going over this thing. So one, one question our students always ask is, when do you get in touch with, with a company, with a bad guy in your, in your story? At what point do you make contact with your target? With, with, with Enbridge. Enbridge, yeah. Oh, I mean, right off the bat, I set up an interview before I even went to Michigan for the first time, and they sat down with me, and they, and they were very open, because I told them, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to put together the chronology of the spill. Now, you know, after the, I mean, 
I basically spent seven months from the time I first went to Michigan to the time we published. And you know, by the fifth month, Jason, the spokesperson from Enbridge, was really sick of me. Elizabeth, when are you going to be done? I said, we'll be done when we're finished with this, but I can't, I don't know when, because we need to fill in all the holes. Did, did you get the same kind of openness from the government, from the federal regulators, the EPA? And um, the EPA was, was very open on this case. We, I was, we were very fortunate there, and I, I built good bonds with those people. The, um, the Department of Transportation, see, it's, it's a strange situation because it's a, it's a branch of the Department of Transportation that does the regulating. Um, they didn't really need to tell us that they didn't know what they were doing because they often had so much trouble answering our questions. I felt like we should be working there and they should be doing our <laughs> job. So that just became abundantly clear, but you can't just say that because that's what, how you feel about something. We had to prove that, which we were able to do with congressional testimony and with other you know, pieces that we put together and Lisa putting together those charts to show you know, the fox is clearly guarding the hen house. Lisa, what uh, were oh, you going to say something? Add one, the one agency that was really knew what they were doing was the National Transportation Safety Board because they launched an investigation as soon as the spill happened and they put out their final report about two weeks after we had published this story. But before they put out the final report, they released 10,000 pages of their raw notes. And so, um, the Inside Climate News publisher and I just spent weeks going over those notes and using it to fact check everything we'd written and pulling out any interesting little details we could. Like from those notes and from their timelines, we discovered that uh, right after the spill, Enbridge called their PR department before they told the federal government. So just little things like that, mm -hmm. that were really helpful and made sure that everything we'd written was correct. So what was the impact of this story? I mean, it's easy to have impact, easier to have impact on speeding cops. Harder, I think, to have an impact on pipeline safety. Yeah, I mean, clearly the, the, the pipeline problem has not been, been solved, and that's going to be a long journey. It seems as if we have, the, the public is becoming more aware that pipelines even exist. I mean, it's sort of like the ocean. You throw things in it, we don't see them. Most pipelines are buried. Now, I mean, we have become, we, we kind of put Dilbit into the vocabulary, for one thing. People became aware of it. Then with this whole Keystone publicity, I think it's meshed where people say, Oh, pipelines, for some reason I need to pay attention to that. So, you know, has Congress come out and rewritten laws? Have, has the regulatory agency under DOT come out and written a whole bunch of new regs and rules? No, they haven't. But it's on the radar screen and the public is pushing for this, especially in places where pipelines exist or are planned. Yeah. One of the things you said there was that the, the people who lived near the Kalamazoo River didn't even know there was a pipeline in their community, right? Yeah. Your turn to ask questions. Please come up. And, and those of you who want to ask, just line up near the mics. And there's another one over there. Hi, um, I'm Charlotte. I was wondering why your opinion on why you think this was the biggest oil spill we'd never heard of until you guys came along. Was it just a timing thing, like but for the Gulf oil uh, spill we would have um, heard about it? Or do you think there were sort of other issues at play as to why it wasn't reported earlier? You know, um, I think you're right about the Gulf spill. That had happened just a few months previous, and everybody was still obsessed with watching that camera and all that oil pouring out of there. And this oil um, <coughs> spilled in a wetland, went into a creek, went into the Kalamazoo River. They ended up closing 38 to 40 miles of the river. It did not reach the Great Lakes, but at in the first couple days, the EPA was absolutely panicked because if it reached the Great Lakes, where millions of people get their drinking water, then you, you would have heard about it and we wouldn't have had this story in the same way. But it was, the, the Gulf spill was just huge. Plus it was kind of the upper Midwest and you know, people look at that as flyover territory for some reason, so. Yes. 
Um, oh, okay. As uh, newsrooms continue to shrink, um, you know, more and more people are going to be doing what you do, which is you know working uh, from home or collaborating remotely. Um, what would you say are the advantages and disadvantages of, of doing what you do? You know, would you prefer to have a newsroom? Would you prefer to have a physical newsroom, I think is the question. Uh, it would be helpful to have a physical newsroom. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I do enjoy not having a commute and sometimes working in my pajamas and stuff. And it can be very comfortable working from home. But there were definitely moments throughout this collaboration when I thought it would be so much easier if we were in the same room, in the same time zone. Um, you know, we would do things like send each other files, maybe the wrong versions of a draft or something, but then you can't call the other person because they're not awake yet, because it's 6 a.m. there. <laughs> Just crazy stuff like that. Um, and it's so much easier to brainstorm and discuss ideas when you can see each other's faces. And right. all we did was have disembodied voices on the phone. But, you know, our, our running joke became, because we were so obsessed with this, and it was we were devoting so much of our staff and we had sort of become, we became a niche publication, we thought we should become inside pipeline news because <laughs> that's what we were doing. Because when you take that many people off of the daily stuff, and you know with the web, you've got to feed the beast all the time. And we were having to find other ways to do that. So it was for the grace of the rest of the staff that they were willing to say, this evidently is important enough to us to continue with this. So it's, it was an experiment, kind of a little bit of a seat of the pants experiment. So, so the gentleman over there, yes. Yeah, I mean, you all probably know now, probably about as much, if not more, about the regulatory apparatus for these things than anyone else in the country at this point. And my question is, you know, what are what were the big problems you discovered in terms of what was wrong, and what, if anything, is sort of like the no-brainer fixes that could prevent maybe some of this from happening. Well, I can start, I mean, what, one thing that's wrong is that people don't know what is flowing through these pipelines. The, the location of pipelines, when you look at a map, it, the agency is called FIMSA, the, the sub-agency under DOT. They don't want terrorists to know exactly where those lines are, so they will be sort of where they are. They'll be in Michigan, but not necessarily near the Kalamazoo River, so that part you know, the, and the, the safety measures. I mean, you, for instance, we did a story where, where they talked about the Keystone XL taking, having 57 new safety measures. And we dug into all of them. 12 of them actually would improve safety. The rest of them were just a bunch of blather. So um, I don't, I, I think those are the big problems that you were finding out pipelines were made of subpar materials and that they aren't maintained and that really, FIMSA relies on the, the actual companies to report problems. Plus, they're allowed to be fined and not have to fix problems. I mean, the, the breaches along Enbridge, the 6B pipeline, were clear, and they weren't forced to, to repair any of them. They would be able to get delays. Do you want to add anything? I, I think when it comes to Dilbit, uh, Dilbit is a product we've only been transporting in pipelines in large quantities since 1999. So it's not regulated any differently from regular crude oil, but it behaves differently when it spills. So that's obviously a gap in the regulations. Um, and, and like Elizabeth said, if, if you don't know what's in the pipeline when it spills, you don't know how you're supposed to manage the cleanup. You know, and it can be very crucial in those first few hours to know what's the best way to clean it up quickly. Sorry. And whether or not people need to be evacuated. The health issue is huge with this because of the benzene. So, you know, the, the uh, head of FIMSA says pipelines and people shouldn't mix, but they clearly are mixing because people are building subdivisions on pipelines as we speak, and nobody knows they're there. And just to clarify one point, so the agency has the power to fine but not to require fixes or something to that nature? They can do both, but they, they seem to be they, be, they are able to get, they don't have companies meeting deadlines. There are constant extensions, and it's, it's this weird gray area. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Uh, do you think that being a smaller, more niche organization helped you get, get a higher level of access, especially to the big corporations? Like, for instance, do you think a New York Times or a Washington Post pursuing the same story would have faced certain obstacles that, that you didn't? Um, 
No, I, I just think it was, I, I think that uh, maybe it was because they were like, well, we don't know who you are, I guess we'll talk to you. I mean, <laughs> so, it, uh, but no, I, I think that we, I think anybody could have pursued this story. We just did it because we saw it as a place that was undercovered and thought, wow, we could maybe make something out of this. Okay, our last question. Hi, you mentioned that um, you were kind of told by the execs that if you keep writing about this, they would be speaking to their friends in Bloomberg. So I was wondering, uh, can you give us a bit more context and how did you deal with that? Did you just like ignore that? Oh, that was, I think that, that was after, that was after you left. Yeah, okay. climate. Um, yeah, it was so this was, uh, once David Hasmeyer joined us and started writing about um, landowners where, landowners were complaining about Enbridge because Enbridge was building a brand new, larger pipeline parallel to the existing one. And there were landowners with conflicts. They said they were being bullied by the company, stuff like that. And at one point, Enbridge called um, our editor, Susan White, and said, you know, we think you've written enough stories now about this new pipeline. You should stop. You've already written two or three. That, that's all you have to do. And obviously, we didn't stop. And then they said, if you keep writing, we'll call our friends at Bloomberg News. And, and Bloomberg syndicates some of our stories. And that's a big deal because they have a lot of their readers are a different audience than the people who read our website. But I guess our editor and publisher decided, you know, if that happened, then it was going to happen. They, we weren't going to stop reporting. So. So thank you.